occurs to me that I'm the perfect guest for a fiction non-fiction conference since my my name is a mix of them. Titan is pure fiction, and then um, every day I'm brought back to the fact that uh, I'm junior, which is pure psychoanalytic reality and non-fiction. So I think I'm I'm at home here. So uh, my theme, much as uh, Richard's, is uh, the, uh, the kind of compromises we are uh, sometimes also willing to take in order to believe the things we we would love to believe. So it, we are basically talking about the same thing, but maybe from a different angle. I was talking about an anecdote. I was uh, walking one of these days or these weeks in downtown Sao Paulo, and and of course it's a it's a vice. Uh, I ran into a, a, a bookshop, a second-rate bookshop, and I had to stop in front of it. Of course, I I, I I'm sure it's a familiar experience to most of you here. And so I started taking a look at the titles on the show, and, and there was this one about uh, Inés de Castro, who is a Portuguese princess of the Middle Ages, who was made a queen after she was dead. And it's a, a, a fable-like topic, uh, which uh, pops up every now and then in Portuguese literature, and most famously in Camões, in the, the Lusia, it's the epic poem uh, that is central to Portuguese literature. And um, I said, wow, a new book about Inés de Castro. And then I, I, I realized that there was a subtitle. And the subtitle said, as dictated by the self. <laughs> to a, a psychographer or whatever, and said, oh, well, this is interesting. Of course, I didn't read the book, but the, the, the cover was enough, uh, but it somehow uh, has to do with our topics here. I mean, the, the fact that we are uh, eager for fantasy, maybe uh, much more so than, uh, than before, and, uh, but on the other hand, uh, that we are equally eager to, to have some seal of, of truth, of authenticity, uh, uh, next to it, stamped onto it. And so we are also eager about to, to read about uh, Portuguese, medieval Portuguese princesses that uh, become queens after they are dead and so on and so forth, or uh, the Game of Thrones or whatever else we read, whatever kind of romance uh, we, we allow ourselves to read uh, when nobody's looking at us. And, uh, but then we are also eager to have the seal of truth, of fact, of, of non-fiction attached to it. So, um, so this is, this is my, my theme today. And, uh, um, and uh, more specifically, my, I, I'd love to, to invite you to, to, to think and discuss about the, this, this thing that comes uh, often with the, uh, with the idea that nonfiction is central to our uh, literary experiences these days. Uh, we don't just want to, to have great nonfiction uh, books, but we want to have Great non-fiction books that read like novels, and this is this is the thing that uh, 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 attracts and annoys me at the same time. Why? What does it mean that uh, a, a non-fiction book or any any book at all uh, should read like a novel? And it irritates me because I think that the standard non-fiction book you get uh, everywhere these days, like uh, the one Anand had uh, in his pocket yesterday, the one about the Taj uh, Hotel and so on and so forth, is is. Uh, is uh, is a non-fiction uh, book or a, a, is a, a, a maybe a serious effort at reportage that uh, looks at the novel as the kind of, of narrative model that will provide uh, intelligibility to, to it all. And uh, so it, it, we are not we don't just want facts. We want uh, understandable uh, facts, facts that will somehow uh, add up to something to a story, as uh, Richard just put. And but more specifically, we, want, we don't just want them to, to, to build up a story, we want, want them to build up a novel. And, uh, and then I, I keep thinking, that uh, uh, why should this be so? Why should we look at the novel as the, uh, as the model for literary, for, uh, for uh, understandability? And more, uh, more to the point, what kind of novel are we looking at when we wish books to read like novels. And my suspicion is that actually uh, um, most, uh, most of the standard nonfiction you get these days uh, has a very, very uh, conservative model of what the novel is all about. So the novel that uh, nonfiction, most nonfiction writers have in mind is this, is this uh, more or less uh, uh, clear-cut plot with uh, very clear-cut characters that develop 
uh, two or three, maybe four lines of, of action, not, not so many, uh, uh, that intersect at given uh, points uh, uh, for given reasons and so on and, and so forth. And, and I think, is, is this really the novel? Is this how the novel came to the world, as this sort of ready-made model for intelligibility? And, and this brings me back to, uh, I'm, a, I'm a literature professor, so it's, it's all another professional wise. And this brings me back to the, the, the origins of the novel in European uh, literature. And when the novel first came, uh, uh, when let's, let's give it a convenient date, when, uh, let's move back to 1605, when Cervantes publishes the first volume of, the first part of Don, Don Quixote, has it really got to do, is the central thing, the central point about the novel that it should make things understandable? Uh, actually, it's the other way around. The, the point about the novel, the point about, uh, about a, a book, a novel like Cervantes' work, like uh, uh, L'Education Sentimentale, which you quoted yesterday, or Ulysses, or uh, the Mrs. Dalloway, or The Waves, or uh, whatever else, um, what would be the, the Dutch uh, novel to quote, uh, Willem Frederik Hermann's uh, The Donkere Kammer, uh, is, it, is the point of these books to make things uh, readily understandable? Or is it the other way around? And I have a feeling that uh, uh, the best the novel has brought to European, uh, to Western cultures, and now to world culture, has got to do with this, with this sense that uh, reality is uh, is uh, is there. It's 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 waiting for us to uh, question it, to uh, research, into it, to uh, examine it. But then it's ultimately unreachable. It's uh, it's it will always be there as a kind of, of uh, irritant element, a provocative element that keeps us uh, moving away from ready-made fictions, from ready-made uh, stories. I remember the, the great literary critic, the Canadian uh, critic, Norther Fry, who once uh, uh, said that, well, human imagination, left to itself, uh, keeps churning out the same thing. It needs something, it some, needs some irritant to produce something, like, a, like an oyster that needs some a uh, small irritant grain of, of sand to produce maybe a pearl or something like that. And so uh, my, I, have a, I have a sense that the novel actually, uh, the history of the novel should, uh, should uh, alert us to the kind, of, the kind of thing that is being served as the non-fiction novel or whatever else. And it, it's got to do actually with the, the experience of limits, gaps, uh, silences, uh, provocations, and of wanting to go ahead and not being able to, to go ahead. And this is, this is uh, what happens, for example, in, in Cervantes. We, he, we would love to make sense of what it's all about, and, and we never actually manage to reach a point in the novel where the whole thing is made understandable from a single perspective. Or is he mad? Is he a madman? Just a madman, or maybe more than a madman? And is, is the world around him just uh, prosaic and uh, and stupid and trivial, or is, is it true life uh, uh, inviting us to take a, a fresh look at it? Uh, the same holds true for uh, another great novel, uh, novel uh, uh, Madame Bovary. Is she, uh, is she a, a heroine? Is, is she really something we should admire? Is she, something, is she someone we, we, we might as well admire and, and despise and so on and so on and so forth? It's got, it's, it keeps repeating itself. This, this is the kind of thing that keeps uh, repeating itself in the history of the novel. Take uh, 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 Flaubert's Education Sentimentale. He, he once described it in, uh, in a letter to a friend. He was uh, in halfway into the, into the writing process of, of, uh, of the novel. It took him seven years, I think. And he said, well, this is going to be not just a novel. It's going to be uh, l'histoire morale de ma génération, the moral history of of, of my generation. And when, then when you come to, to the actual novel, to the final uh, text of the novel, well, of course, it's, it's full of innuendos, but there's nothing like a moral you could pick out, pick up and out of the, of the novel. It's, it's, uh, you're, you're brought back, you were in 1870 when he uh, finally publishes the, the, the novel, you're brought back to 1848 and to the sense of puzzlement that these things happening just in, in front of your face and uh, without a tag, without a, a, 
without a tag attached to them, uh, explaining what this or that means, or who uh, this character is or might be. They are there in their uh, usual, in a, in a sort of heightened opacity, heightened, uh, 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 as a heightened riddle, offering themselves and provocating us as we read. So which makes me think that, uh, to, you, to put it in a more general sense, the novel is that, uh, is that, uh, is that genre, that tries to bring non-fiction into the world of fiction. And uh, so it's, it's fiction, of course. We all, we all know it's fiction. But then the distinctive thing about it is that it tries repeatedly and, and, uh, to bring some sort of reality, raw reality, into the world of fiction as, as, uh, as a challenge to fiction, as a challenge to our need and desire for fiction. I mean, Madame Bovary would be a much easier uh, word to read if if there, there were nothing there was nothing uh, uncertain about who she is and about what she's 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 doing to herself to her husband to her um, to her little daughter and so on and so forth but then it wouldn't be Madame Bovary it would be La Dame aux Camélias it would be something mu uh, much more much simpler much uh, much less uh, ambivalent much less interesting I dare say and the thing about the uh, Nonfiction uh, that goes uh, that we keep reading these days is that it seems to me to look at the well, I don't want to sound like a policeman, but uh, much as I'm not, I I don't want to tell what you should read and what you should write. But I have the sense that the the best, the, the worst of what you get as nonfiction today it has got to do with uh, with a conservative take on the novel. Uh, and people looking at the novel and thinking of maybe in the best case Le Miserable and uh, La Dame aux Camélias, and not at uh, L'Education Sentimentale, Madame Bovary, Don Quixote, um, Prime Punishment, and so on, and, and so forth. So this is... Uh, uh, and on the other hand, uh, you have, you have second-rate uh, fiction that, uh, being published all the time in all languages. Uh, it would be would be easy to say, oh, it's an, it's an Anglo-American uh, phenomenon, but no, it's, it's everywhere. It's, uh, uh, the great American novel is being published everywhere in the world, in many uh, languages, and it looks the same everywhere, as, uh, as you know. Uh, but also, you have, to, you, you have this, this, uh, this kind of, of standard uh, novel being written uh, with, a, with a certain uh, appetite for the, the seal of authenticity of fact, uh, of fact and so on. Uh, and so on. Um, maybe, uh, and here I'm, I'm going to disagree with Neil, uh, maybe it's the case, for example, of, of uh, uh, um, an important book by Vargas Llosa, which is The War at the End of the, of the World. And it's, a, as you know, I hope I won't be too patriotic here, uh, but the thing is, uh, it's a novel about this, uh, this uh, uprising in northeastern Brazil and the last years of the 19th century, it, it's, uh, it's based on a, on a Brazilian classic, a Brazilian non-fiction classic called Los Sertões by Euclides da Cunha. Vargas Llosa is, is, of course, a, a completely honest man, and he's so too ready to, to, to confess his debt and his admiration to, to this book. But uh, when you read it, uh, the problem about it, to me at least, is that it's, it's too good. It's too well written. It makes up for, uh, for such an understandable and, uh, uh, plot, uh, view, and version of what happened there that uh, it all of a sudden loses all of its interest, all of, all of, its, uh, all of its intriguing character. I mean, why these people... Imagine a messianic uprising in, 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 a, in a kind of desert in, 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 uh, in some, somewhere uh, in northeastern Brazil, and these people... Are, we are in the first years of the Brazilian Republic. These people want the... Uh, the emperor back, the emperor, uh, you should know, it uh, comes from a, a, an Austrian family. And so now all of a sudden these people who've never seen the emperor want him back uh, be, because they have some millenary uh, beliefs about uh, this or that and so on. And, and it all ends in a massacre. I mean, uh, people were not just uh, killed, but they were slaughtered by the, uh, the thousands. And then all of a sudden this becomes fully accessible fully understandable. And at the same moment, I think, well, what's next? What's the next novel I, I'm going to read? The whole, uh, the whole interest, the whole, um, the whole violence and the shocking 
character of it all gets lost the moment it, it's so readily and so maybe cheaply understandable. It makes history as, as, as readable as any standard novel you get uh, pretty much anywhere. In, in sharp contrast to Vargas Llosa's own uh, first novel about his own uh, childhood and, 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 and young years in, uh, in Peru, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the very first one, uh, La Cila y los Perros, The City and the Dogs, which is absolutely great also because, uh, well, you probably read it, there's, there's a, a shocking uh, event in the middle of it and nobody really comes out of the novel really knowing whether what actually happened and who was behind it all. And so uh, I wonder whether this we are not moving in many, in many uh, cases to walk towards a sort of ersatz reality. Uh, whether we are talking about novels that look for the stamp of authenticity or whether we are uh, talking about non-fiction words that look for the readability of, of uh, a novel. This is, this is the kind of thing that keeps coming back to my mind every time uh, I, I stop to think about these things. I was going to uh, mention a few, uh, a few French books. If uh, we could leave this for for later, I think I, I've I've gone beyond my tangents. Okay, thank you very much.